Way out at the end of a tiny little town was an old overgrown garden. And in the garden was an old house. And in the house lived Pippi Longstocking. She was nine years old, and she lived there all alone. Once upon a time, Pippi had had a father of whom she was extremely fond. Naturally, she had had a mother, too. But that was so long ago that Pippi didn't remember her at all. Her mother had died when Pippi was just a tiny baby and lay in a cradle and howled so that nobody could go anywhere near her. Her father, Pippi, had not forgotten. He was a sea captain who sailed on the great ocean, and Pippi had sailed with him in his ship until one day her father blew overboard in a storm and disappeared. He had bought the old house in the garden many years ago. He thought he would live there with Pippi when he grew old and couldn't sail the seas any longer. And then this annoying thing had to happen, that he blew into the ocean. And while Pippi was waiting for him to come back, she went straight home to Villa Villicula. That was the name of the house. It stood there ready and waiting for her. Two things she took with her from the ship. A little monkey, whose name was Mr. Nilsson, he was a present from her father, and a big suitcase full of gold pieces. Pippi was a remarkable child. The most remarkable thing about her was that she was so strong. She was so very strong that in the whole wide world there was not a single police officer who was as strong as she. Why, she could lift a whole horse if she wanted to. And she wanted to. She had a horse of her own that she had bought with one of her many gold pieces the day she came home to Villa Villicula. She had always longed for a horse, and now here he was living on the porch. When Pippi wanted to drink her afternoon coffee there, she simply lifted him down into the garden. Beside Villa Villicula was another garden and another house. In the house lived a father and mother and two charming children, a boy and a girl. The boy's name was Tommy and the girl's Annika. They were good, well brought up and obedient children. On that lovely summer day when Pippi, for the first time, stepped over the threshold of Villa Villicula for her morning walk, Tommy and Annika were standing by their gate looking out onto the street. Pippi was the most remarkable girl Tommy and Annika had ever seen. This is the way she looked. Her hair, the color of a carrot, was braided in two tight braids that stuck straight out. Her nose was the shape of a very small potato and was dotted all over with freckles. It must be admitted that the mouth under this nose was a very wide one with strong white teeth. Her dress was rather unusual. Pippi herself had made it. She had meant it to be blue, but there wasn't quite enough blue cloth, so Pippi had sewed little red pieces on it here and there. On her long, thin legs, she wore a pair of long stockings, one brown and the other black, and she had on a pair of black shoes that were exactly twice as long as her feet. These shoes her father had bought for her in South America so that Pippi should have something to grow into and she never wanted to wear any others. But the thing that made Tommy and Annika open their eyes widest of all was the monkey sitting on the strange girl's shoulder. It was a little monkey dressed in blue pants, yellow jacket, and a white straw hat. Pippi walked along the street with one foot on the sidewalk and the other in the gutter. Tommy and Annika watched as long as they could see her. In a little while, she came back, and now she was walking backward. That was because she didn't want to turn around to get home. When she reached Tommy's and Annika's gate, she stopped. Why did you walk backward? Why did I walk backward? Isn't this a free country? Can't a person walk any way he wants to? For that matter, let me tell you that in Egypt, everybody walks that way, and nobody thinks it's the least bit strange. How do you know? You've never been in Egypt, have you? <laughs> I've never been in Egypt. 
Indeed I have. That's one thing you can be sure of. I have been all over the world and seen many things stranger than people walking backward. I wonder what you would have said if I had come along walking on my hands the way they do in farthest India. Now you must be lying. You're right, I am lying. It's wicked to lie. Oh, yes, it's very wicked to lie. But I forget it now and then. And how can you expect a little child whose mother is an angel and whose father is king of a cannibal island and who herself has sailed on the ocean all her life? Well, how can you expect her to tell the truth always? And for that matter, let me tell you that in the Belgian Congo there is not a single person who tells the truth. Well, they lie all day long, begin at seven in the morning and, and keep on till sundown. So if I should happen to lie now and then, you must try to excuse me and remember it is only because I stayed in the Belgian Congo a little too long. We can be friends anyway, can't we? Oh, sure. Uh, I'm Tommy. And I'm Annika. By the way, why couldn't you come and have breakfast with me? Why not? Come on, let's go. Oh, yes, let's. But first I must introduce you to Mr. Nilsson. The little monkey took off his cap and bowed politely. Then they all went in through Villa Villa Cooler's tumble-down garden gate, along the gravel path bordered with old moss-covered trees, really good climbing trees they seemed to be, up to the house and onto the porch. There stood the horse, munching oats out of a soup bowl. Why do you have a horse on the porch? Well, he'd be in the way in the kitchen, and he doesn't like the parlor. Do you live here all alone? Of course not. Mr. Nielsen and the horse live here, too. Yes, but I mean, don't you have any mother or father here? No, not the least tiny little bit of one. But who tells you when to go to bed at night and things like that? Well, I tell myself. First, I tell myself in a nice, friendly way. And then, if I don't mind, I tell myself again more sharply. And if I still don't mind, well, then I'm in for a spanking. See? Now we're gonna make a pancake. Now there's gonna be a panky. Now we're gonna fry a pancake. She took three eggs and threw them up in the air. One fell down on her head and broke, so that the yolk ran into her eyes. But the others she caught skillfully in a bowl where they smashed to pieces. Oh, I always did hear that egg yolk was good for the hair. You wait and see. Mine will soon begin to grow so fast it crackles. As a matter of fact, in Brazil, all the people go about with eggs in their hair, and there are no bald-headed people. Only once was there a man who was so foolish that he ate his eggs instead of rubbing them on his hair. He became completely bald-headed, and when he showed himself on the street, there was such a riot that the radio police were called out. Pippi had neatly picked the eggshells out of the bowl with her fingers. Now she took a bath brush that hung on the wall and began to beat the pancake batter so hard that it splashed all over the walls. At last, she poured what was left onto a griddle that stood on the stove. When the pancake was brown on one side, she tossed it halfway up to the ceiling so that it turned right around in the air. And then she caught it on the griddle again. And when it was ready, she threw it straight across the kitchen, right onto a plate that stood on the table. Eat! Eat before it gets cold! Tommy and Annika ate and thought it a very good pancake. Suppose you go home now so that you can come back tomorrow. Because if you don't go home, you can't come back. And that'd be a shame. So they went home, past the horse, who had now eaten up all the oats, and out through the gate of Billy Billicula. Mr. Nilsson waved his hat at them as they left. Annika woke up early the next morning. Wake up, Tommy. Wake up. Let's go see that funny girl with the big shoes. I knew even while I was sleeping that something exciting was going to happen today, but I didn't remember what it was. And a whole hour before their mother expected them, they came sliding down the banister and landed at the breakfast table. What's going to happen today that you're in such a hurry? We're going to see the new girl next door. We may stay all day. That morning, Pippi was busy making pepper cocker. That's a kind of Swedish cookie. She had made an enormous amount of dough and rolled it out on the kitchen floor. Tommy and Annika watched her carefully. Why on the floor? 
Because what earthly use is a baking board when one plans to make at least 500 cookies? Stop climbing around in the dough, Mr. Nilsson. Pippi could work fast, she could. Tommy and Annika thought it was good as a circus. Done. What are you going to do now? Well, I don't know what you're going to do, but I know I can't lie around and be lazy. I'm a thing finder, and when you're a thing finder, you don't have a minute to spare. What did you say you are? A thing finder. What's that? Well, somebody who hunts for things, naturally. What else could it be? The whole world is full of things, and somebody has to look for them. And that's just what a thing finder does. What kind of things? All kinds. Lumps of gold, uh, ostrich feathers, dead rats, candy snap crackers, and little tiny screws, and things like that. What fun! We shall see what we shall see. One always finds something. But we gotta hurry up and get going so that other thing finders don't pick up all the lumps of gold around here before we get to them. All three thing finders now set out. Tommy and Annika looked at Pippi to see just how a thing finder acted. Pippi ran from one side of the road to the other, shaded her eyes with her hand, and hunted and hunted. Sometimes she crawled about on her hands and knees, or stuck her hands in between the pickets of a fence. Oh, dear. I was sure I saw a lump of gold. May we really take everything we find? Yes, everything that is lying on the ground. Presently, they came to an old man lying asleep on the lawn outside his cottage. There. That man is lying on the ground, and we have found him. We'll take him. No. No, Pippi, we can't take an old gentleman. We couldn't possibly. Anyway, whatever would we do with him? What would we do with him? Well, there are plenty of things we could do with him. We could... Keep him in a little rabbit hutch instead of a rabbit and feed him on dandelions. But if you don't want to, I don't care. Though it does bother me to think that some other thing finder may come along and grab him. Well, I never saw the like. What a fine, what a fine, an old tin can. Now, that's something you can never have too many of. What can you use it for? Oh, you can use it all sorts of ways. Well, one way is to put cookies in it. Then it becomes a delightful jar with cookies. Another way is not to put cookies in it. Then it becomes a jar without cookies. That certainly isn't quite so delightful, but still that's good too. It's almost as if this were a jar without cookies. But you can put it over your head and pretend that it's midnight. And that is just what she did. With the can on her head, she wandered around the block like a little metal tower and never stopped until she stumbled over a low wire fence and fell flat on her stomach. Now, see that? If I hadn't had this thing on me, I'd have fallen flat on my face and hurt myself terribly. Yes, but if you had not had the can on your head, then you wouldn't have tripped on the wire fence in the first place. It's really they're hurting. Oh, how can they be so mean? On, it's that it awful thing. She's always in a fight and five against one. Get what coward. Oh, what's more I'll do it. Pippi went up to the boys and tapped cool. Bank on the back with her forefinger. Hello there. What's the idea? Are you trying to make hash out of little Willie with all five of you jumping on him at once? Boys, boys, let Willie alone and take a look at this girl. What a babe. Have you ever seen hair like hers? Red as fire and such shoes. Can I borrow one? I like to go out rowing and I haven't any boats. <laughs> <laughs> he took hold of one of Pippi's braids. Ouch, I burned myself. <laughs> red, 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 red. I don't think you have a hey. very nice way with ladies. Oh. And suddenly she lifted him in her strong arms hey, high in the air oh. and carried him <laughs> to a birch tree and hung him over a branch. Oh. Oh, no. Then she took the next boy and hung him over another branch. The next one she set on a gate post outside a cottage. And the next she threw right over a fence so that he landed in a flower bed. The last of the fighters she put in a tiny toy cart that stood by the road. You are cowards. Five of you attack one boy. Boy, that's cowardly. Then you begin to push a helpless little girl around. Oh, how mean. Come on now, we'll go home. 
If they try to hurt you again, Willie, you come and tell me. Hey, you up there, Bank. Is there anything else you have to say about my hair or my shoes? If so, you better say it now before I go home. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> It soon became known throughout the little town that a nine-year-old girl was living all by herself in Villa Villicula. And all the ladies and gentlemen in the town thought this would never do. All children must have someone to advise them. And all children must go to school to learn the multiplication tables. So the ladies and gentlemen decided that the little girl in Villa Villicula must immediately be placed in a children's home. One lovely afternoon, Pippi had invited Tommy and Annika over for afternoon coffee and peppercocker. She had spread the party out on the front steps. It was so sunny and beautiful there, and the air was filled with the fragrance of the flowers in Pippi's garden. Mr. Nilsson climbed around on the porch railing, and every now and then the horse stuck out his head so that he'd be invited to have a cookie. Oh, isn't it glorious to be alive? Just at that moment, a police officer in full uniform came in through the gate. Hooray! This must be my lucky day, too. Policemen are the very best things I know, next to rhubarb pudding. Is this the girl who has moved into Villa Villa Coola? Quite the contrary. This is the tiny little auntie who lives on the third floor at the other end of the town. Don't be such a smarty. Some nice people in the town are arranging for you to get into a children's home. I already have a place in a children's home. What? Has it been arranged already then? What children's home? This one. I am a child, and this is my home. Therefore, it is a children's home, and I have room enough here, plenty of room. Dear child, you don't understand. You must get into a real children's home and have someone look after you. Is one allowed to bring horses to your children's home? No, of course not. That's what I thought. Well, what about monkeys? <laughs> of course not. You ought to realize that. Well, then, you'll have to get kids for your children's home somewhere else. I certainly don't intend to move there. But don't you understand that you must go to school? Why? To learn things, of course. What sort of things? All sorts. Lots of useful things. The multiplication tables, for instance. I have got along fine without any plotification tables for nine years. I guess I'll get along without it from now on, too. Yes, but just think how embarrassing it will be for you to be so ignorant. Imagine when you grow up and somebody asks you what the capital of Portugal is and you can't answer. Oh, I can answer all right. I'll answer like this. If you were so bound and determined to find out what the capital of Portugal is, then for goodness sakes, write directly to Portugal and ask. Yes, but don't you think that you would be sorry not to know it yourself? Oh, probably. No doubt I should lie awake nights and wonder and wonder what in the world is the capital of Portugal? But one can't be having fun all the time. For that matter, I've been in Lisbon with my papa. Well, you must come to the children's home and immediately. That's what you think. Tag! <laughs> come back here! Come back here! Before he could wink an eye, she had climbed up on the porch railing and from there onto the balcony above the porch. The policeman rushed into the house and up the stairs. But by the time he had reached the balcony, Pippi was halfway up the roof. She climbed up the shingles almost as if she were a little monkey herself. In a moment, she was up on the ridge pole and from there jumped easily to the chimney. Down on the balcony stood the policeman, scratching his head. And on the lawn stood Tommy and Annika, staring at Pippi. Isn't it fun to play tag? <laughs> Weren't you nice to come over? It certainly is my lucky day, too. When the policeman had stood there a while wondering what to do, he went and got a ladder leaned it against one of the gables of the house and then climbed up to get Pippi down. He looked a little scared when he climbed out on the ridge pole and, carefully balancing himself, went step by step toward Pippi. Don't be scared. There's nothing to be afraid of. It's just fun. When he was a few steps away from Pippi, down she jumped from the chimney and ran along the ridge pole to the opposite gable. 
a few feet from the house stood a tree. Now I'm gonna die. And she jumped right down into the green crown of the tree, caught fast hold of a branch, swung back and forth a while, and then let herself fall to the ground. Quick as a wink, she dashed around to the other side of the house and took away the ladder. The policeman had looked a little foolish when Pippi jumped, but he looked even more so when he had balanced himself backward along the ridge pole and was about to climb down the ladder. Oh, get that ladder and get it quick, or you'll see something you're not looking for. Why are you so cross at me? We're just playing tag, aren't we? Oh, come on. Won't you be a good girl and put the ladder back so that I can get down? Of course I will. And when you get down, we can all drink coffee and have a happy time. But the policeman was certainly tricky, because the minute he was down on the ground, again he pounced on Pippi. Now you'll get it, you little brat. Oh no, I'm sorry. I haven't time to play any longer, but it was fun. Then she took hold of the policeman by his belt and carried him down the garden path out through the gate and onto the street. There she set him down, and it was quite some time before he was ready to get up again. Of course, Tommy and Annika went to school. Each morning at eight o'clock, they trotted off, hand in hand, swinging their school bags, they always looked longingly toward Villa Villicula as they started off to school. One day they determined to try to persuade Pippi to come too. You can't imagine what a nice teacher we have. If you only knew what fun it is in school, I'd die if I couldn't go to school. You don't have to stay so very long, just until two o'clock. Yes, and besides, we get Christmas vacation and Easter vacation and summer vacation. Pippi bit her big toe thoughtfully. It's not fair. It's absolutely unfair. I don't intend to stand it. What's the matter now? In four months, it'll be Christmas, and then you'll have Christmas vacation. But I, well, I get no Christmas vacation, not even the tiniest bit of a Christmas vacation. Well, something will have to be done about that. Tomorrow morning, I'll begin school. Hooray! We'll wait for you right outside our gate at 8 o'clock. Tommy and Annika had told their teacher that a new girl named Pippi Longstocking was coming. And the teacher had already heard about Pippi in the little town. So when Pippi strode into the schoolroom the next day, she was not entirely surprised. Welcome to school, little Pippi. I hope that you will enjoy yourself here and learn a great deal. Yes. And I hope I'll get some Christmas vacation. That's the reason I've come. It's only fair, you know. If you would first tell me your whole name, then I'll register you in school. My name is... Pippolotta Delicatessa Windershade Mackleman, Ephraim's daughter Longstocking. Daughter of Captain Ephraim Longstocking, formerly the terror of the sea, now a cannibal king. Pippi is really only a nickname because Papa thought that Pippolotta was too long to say. Indeed. Well, then, we shall call you Pippi, too. But now, suppose we test you a little and see what you know. You're a big girl and no doubt know a great deal already. Uh, let us begin with arithmetic. Uh, Pippi, can you tell me what seven and five are? Well, if you don't know that yourself, you needn't think I'm going to tell you. We don't answer that way in school. I beg your pardon? Oh, I didn't know that. I, I won't do it again. No, let's hope not. Uh, and now I will tell you that seven and five are twelve. See that? You knew it yourself. Why are you asking then? Well, now, Pippi, how much do you think eight and four are? Oh, about sixty-seven. Of course not. Eight and four are twelve. Well, now, really, my dear little woman, that is carrying things too far. You just said that seven and five are twelve. Oh, there should be some rhyme and reason even to things in school. Furthermore, if you are so childishly interested in that foolishness, why don't you sit down in a corner by yourself and then do arithmetic and leave us alone so we can play tag? Can Tommy answer this one? If Lisa has seven apples and Axel has nine apples, how many apples do they have together? Yes, you tell Tommy. 
And tell me, too, if Lisa gets a stomachache and Axel gets more stomachache, whose fault is it and where did they get hold of the apples in the first place? The teacher decided to give up arithmetic altogether. She thought maybe Pippi would prefer to learn to read. Now, Pippi, you'll see something jolly. You see here a picture of an ibex, and the letter in front of this ibex is called I. Well, that I'll never believe. I think it looks exactly like a straight line with a little fly speck over it. But what I'd really like to know is, what has the ibex to do with the fly speck? All right. Suppose instead we all sing a little song. You go ahead and sing. I'll rest myself a while. Too much learning breaks even the healthiest. Do you know what? It was awfully jolly to come to school to find out what it was like. But I don't think I care about going to school anymore, Christmas vacation or no Christmas vacation. There's altogether too many apples and ibexes and things like that. It makes me dizzy in the head. I hope that you, teacher, won't be sorry. I certainly am sorry, most of all because you won't behave decently. Have I behaved badly? Well, goodness, I didn't know that. You understand, teacher, don't you, that when you have a mother who's an angel and a father who's a cannibal king and when you have sailed on the ocean all your life, then you don't know just how to behave in school with all the apples and ibexes. I understand, Pippi. Maybe you can come back to school when you're a little older. Oh, I think you're awfully nice, teacher. So long, kids. Bye. 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 Now, you won't see me for a while, but always remember how many apples Axel had, or you'll be sorry. Sorry.